This is the age of the product leader. When I started the company, product school, eight years ago, I saw the role go from almost non-existent to really be at the table and be part of some of the most important decisions of the company. In fact, one out of three companies in the Fortune 100 have a chief product officer today. Let me say that again. 33% of the 100 biggest companies in the world already recognize the need for putting product at the table and have a chief product officer. Not so long ago, the highest ranked product person in the organization would report into a chief marketing officer or a chief technology officer. So that is providing a huge shift into how companies are going about building and shipping these days. The other data point that is huge for me is that over the last three years, this role has grown over 41%. So it's only getting bigger for all of us. And by the way, I'm not saying all of this just because we are surrounded by 2,000 or more product leaders in London and joined by many more thousand PMs from all over the world online. This is truly a global phenomenon that is happening all around the world. And today I'm going to do my best to show you how to make the most out of it for you and your teams. But before we go into the future, I want to take a quick step back and show you where we're coming from. Because if you use the word product in the, la in the late 90s, most of people would probably associate that with something physical, like, like a physical product. Uh, obviously, that definition has evolved quite a bit. 2001, the Agile Manifesto was launched. And that was a huge inflection point for all of us because they showed a new way of building. They, they show how you can build digital products differently than physical products, how you can take feedback from the customer, how you can shorten some of your delivery times and iterate quickly based on feedback, not so much on a whiteboard idea. 2002, 2003, Google launched their first associate product manager program, APM program. And they did it because they were hiring product managers. They realized they needed more product people. However, there weren't really you know, external solutions out there. So they built their own, a mini or an internal product school. And that was also a new indicator that the market, the traditional education institutions weren't really providing the type of professionals that some of the companies were looking for. So as we move forward, um, there's a venture capital firm called Andreessen Horowitz. It's a huge one, one of the most, the, one of the biggest and more prestigious venture capital firms. They were, they were created in 2009, and then in 2010, they launched this incredible blog article. It became very popular. It was titled, Software is Eating the World. And in that article, they referenced how the internet was here to stay, how internet wasn't just a place for people to consume information. It was also a place for businesses to do business, for peers to do business. They talked about the adoption of smartphones. They talked about the adoption of social media and some of the macro trends that are here today. A few years later, and I'm sure you will realize or you resonate with this, we started seeing the evolution of some of the tools and products that product managers use on a daily basis. Long gone are the days where we had to piggyback on tools designed for designers or marketers or engineers. You know, like now product managers have their own tech where they can build roadmaps, they can create wireframes, they can run A-B tests, and these tools are specifically created for them in mind. In fact, all of the sponsors that you see here with us today started around 2010, 2015, and now many of them are public companies or have a unicorn status. So this is definitely here to stay and it's growing really fast. And part of it is because those tools are also very, very visual or even no code. And that's huge for a lot of us as creators because now we can be much more self-sufficient. We can get to value faster. We can build more independently without having to rely too much on additional teams. 2014, 2015, Microsoft and Google appointed their current CEOs, and they both come from product backgrounds. So this is not just about having a seat at the table. It's also happening that many companies have product CEOs, which is super encouraging for a lot of us because that mindset can be applied to build for your own 
the same way you can build at a larger organization. And of course, you know, if you think about the coronavirus, um, this probably expo exposed a lot of these trends and accelerated them. The last time we did ProductCon London in person was in February of 2020. And I'm so excited to be back. And it looks so, so different in a good way because now remote work is not a new thing anymore and it's proven to be working in many cases. A lot of businesses in many different industries were forced to use online as, as the channel to, to survive and thrive. So we're seeing how all of this is really, really empowering more creators. Ultimately, we are realizing that being a software product, or sorry, a, sorry, a software company is not enough. Now, Ape companies are not just tech companies. Companies are digital experience companies. And product leaders are leading the charge here. We are in this age. And I wanted to take a few minutes to give you real human examples of some of these product leaders, because I think it's important to put a face to the name. Uh, I had the privilege to interact with many product leaders throughout my career, and I wanted to handpick these three for different reasons. First of all, when I use the word product leader, I mean it in the most inclusive way. Leaders lead regardless of their title. This is not just for CEOs, CPOs, executive vice presidents of product, or other fancy titles. To me, a product leader is someone who has the mindset of partnering with other people in the organization, with their team, outside their team, in order to build and ship something that matters to their users. So Mamuna is the VP of product at Shopify, some of the largest e-commerce platforms in the world. Alex is a principal product manager at Slack. And Stephanie is the head of product at Twitch. Two of the things these people have in common, other than building products for millions of people every day, is number one, they are very active contributors to our community. They truly want to give back and participate as instructors because they didn't have a platform like this when they were getting started. And number two is that none of them have a computer science degree. And by the way, there's absolutely nothing with computer <laughs> against or wrong with computer science degrees. I actually have one. Uh, my point is that becoming a product leader is not so much about what you studied a few years ago in terms of your traditional degree. It's really about who you want to become. When we ran a report with Amplitude, we found out that 73% of the product managers we interviewed didn't have a computer science degree. And I'm saying this because I think it's very important for us to realize that there's a lot of misconceptions around what do I have to start in college or if I do an, need an MBA. Well, that might help you, but that's definitely not a requirement these days in order to break or lead products. So here's the promised land. If you are a product-led organization, if you have some of this product talent in place, you are going to immediately notice some improvements. And number one is revenue growth. Product is not just at the end of the experience behind a paywall. Product is at the center of the business, and it's part of the entire end-to-end -end experience from, hey, I'm a visitor to this website or mobile app even before I become a customer, all the way through, not only I became a customer, I'm also a super fan, and I'm using this on a daily basis, and I want to stay engaged. So we're seeing product teams owning part of revenue. This is basically allowing users to buy directly throughout without human interaction. But not only that, product-led growth organizations are also empowering sales teams to focus their time on type of clients that actually require human interaction or they need some, some sort of customization. So, Sales folks, <laughs> you are not disappearing by any means. Being in a product-led organization is actually going to make sales grow for your team as well. The same way no-code tools are not here to make engineers disappear by any means. It's actually empowering PMs to be more self-sufficient and help engineers, in this case, to focus on specific parts of the product that actually need engineering. So this is a report from a VC, VC firm called OpenView where they focus on the SaaS industry, software as a service, and they show that companies that are applying product-led growth strategies are growing revenue 30%, 13% faster than the ones that are not applying PLG yet. The second thing we see in product-led organizations 
is that they are actually building deeper partnerships with different functions within the entire company. I'm sure you're familiar with this classic Venn diagram that shows product as the intersection in between business, technology, and design. That is not enough anymore. Product, if product is at the center of the whole company, we are going to need to build deeper partnerships with additional functions such as customer success, data, and sales, just to name a few. So if you zoom in into this Venn diagram, how are we actually going to make it happen? Well, the actual product org is evolving as well. It's looking more like a T, has a T shape, because the product team is not only made up of product managers. There are business analysts, there are software engineers, there are designers, many other roles. I consider those roles to be generalist roles. Now, if we're saying that we need to empower the product team to really build those deeper partnerships and be more self-sufficient, to be able to ship faster and more efficiently, we're also going to need to develop certain capabilities inside the product org. We are seeing certain roles such as product operations, product analytics, growth product, yeah! <laughs> I see some of these people in the room today. And some of the stats are taken from companies like Pendo or LinkedIn. We are seeing that the same way the need for chief product officers and product managers is growing, the need for more of these product analysts, product growth PMs and product ops people is also growing with it. So I'm kind of sold because, okay, if I'm more P product-led and I hire the right product leaders, it seems like I'm going to grow revenue. I'm going to build stronger partnerships with different teams within the organization. But Houston or London, we have a problem here, which is, okay, how do we go about it, really? You know, if you're in a startup environment, maybe your company was remote first, or the founder is a product CEO, or you, you can still make those adjustments, or maybe you don't even need to make any adjustments because you were born with this type of mindset. But obviously, reality is different for every company at all stages. And what we noticed is that 26% of the product managers we surveyed in our report, it's called the Future of Product Management, we surveyed over 5,000 product managers. So 26% of them said that they are considering to leave their current company within the next 12 months. Some of you may be thinking, well, that's not me because I run an NPS survey and my, my employee said that they're all happy. Well, <laughs> but what if it's you? What if in addition to having to worry around hiring more product talent to become more product led, we also need to hire to replace some of the rising stars that we have in the team already. And by the way, even if you just hire good PMs and you keep a leaky bucket, they might leave soon as well. So the retention is real, not just for users, but for team members. Now, here's the good news. The same people that said that they were open to leaving the company, they also said that they were willing to stay. So 94% of the people that we surveyed in the entire, in the entire report said that the number one non-financial incentive the number one reason why they would like to stay in a company for a long period of time is if there is investment in their own learning and growth. And by the way, there's another misconception in product around, well, training is good for the aspiring product manager or the junior person. If I'm in the game already, I'm good. <laughs> well, let me tell you something. I, yes, oh, so many things, obviously, we can all learn from experience by hitting walls, by failing. I get it, and I'm you know, also doing that. And I think there are certain best practices and frameworks that can be applied by just looking to our neighbor or by looking to different neighbors. So the point here that I'm trying to make is that learning or training is the bigger lever for employee retention. And when you look at the market, you see that the cost of hiring a product manager is around 200,000 pounds if you bake in hiding fees, and maybe the time that it takes for this product manager to be up to speed. I know my slide is in dollars. I, I'm coming from San Francisco, but I, I try to do the real-time translation <laughs> here. And that's insane, because even if you want to throw money at the problem, it's just not going to be a sustainable strategy in the long term. So obviously, there are many flavors to how companies approach learning and development. 
Uh, I mentioned Google before. There are a few other companies that are, have their own associate product manager programs. Examples are Uber or Intuit or Amazon. That's great for the very few people who get in. Other companies give education stipends to their employees to empower them to pick whatever type of training or solution they need. There are mentoring and coaching programs. It's all good in my mind. The point is, truth is somewhere in the middle. And while acquiring talent is, is critical, retention is the name of the game. So before I leave you, I just want to share one more thought. And I want to appeal to the morale of all of you here. I want to appeal to the morale of the product leaders. And I, and I, and I see some nervous laughs. Uh, I'm not going to put anybody on the spot. I'm a huge fan of Star Wars. And uh, so in true Star Wars fashion, you probably have the dark side of the force telling you one thing and the bright side of the force telling you another. Dark side of the force is saying, hey, none of this stuff that you just said is new. I knew it, but I'm good because I have recruiters pinging me all the time on LinkedIn. I know that product management is not a secret anymore. It's hot. There are more companies hiring product managers than ever before. Uh, maybe I just got a raise or a title promotion. So I can just cruise. And you might be right for a short period of time. The bright side of the force is saying, hey, there is a window. You have a beautiful opportunity. This is probably the best time in history to be building digital products. And if you capitalize on this opportunity for you, for your team, if you really care about them and invest in them, they are going to take better care of your users. And ultimately, they are going to take better care of your business. So I encourage you to consider the bright side of the force. Thank you very much.